morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Mike Duncan's new book, A Hero of Two Worlds, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after over 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Mike and Alexis, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so truly appreciative of all of you. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Mike Duncan for an event to launch his new book, Hero of Two Worlds, The Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution. Mike Duncan is one of the most popular history podcasters in the world and author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Storm Before the Storm. His award-winning series, The History of Rome, remains a legendary landmark in the history of podcasting. Duncan's ongoing series, Revolutions, explores the great political revolutions that have driven the course of modern history. Joining Mike in conversation tonight is Alexis Coe. Alexis Coe is a presidential historian and the New York Times bestselling author of You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington, now out in paperback, and Alice Plus Frida Forever, a murder in Memphis, soon to be a major motion picture. Alexis was a consulting producer on and appeared in Doris Kearns Goodwin's Washington series on the History Channel, and she regularly appears on MSNBC and CNN. She has contributed to The New Yorker, The New York Times, and many others. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mike and Alexis to the stage. Hello. Hi. Hello. So first of all, congratulations to, to Mike for this new book, which I know all of you have picked up because you're here tonight. But if I can encourage you to overspend, I would recommend buying a second copy or getting it from your library because one of the most rewarding things that I heard, having also written a book on someone who was a part of the American Revolution, is that books on this topic can enable you to talk to family members and friends and other people who you haven't been able to connect with on American history. And I really find it to be like a totally enriching, um, I joined a family book group recently and so now I'm pushing it on everyone. I wanna say to Mike, Congratulations on the book, but also congratulations on finding one of the very few rich, unproblematic white men. Like, it's, it's nearly impossible. So let's just start out with well done, good choice. God um, bless you, Marquis, for mostly do, having it mostly right. But I think that's the thing. Like not yeah. only did he have it mostly right, but he didn't die for having it mostly right, like mm -hmm. John Brown. And so he's not a martyr. And he's also, not, he hasn't disappeared into oblivion because he held these beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that's like because I have written, as, as was reviewed, I have written about a murderer and I have written about Washington who is not an uncomplicated figure when you talk about, when you say hero. Um, so what is that like to study someone who, it's almost like you have to pull back a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, in the course of doing both the history of Rome and revolutions, I have met many, many different kinds of people, right? I mean, like Julius Caesar, uh, Augustus, I mean, these guys, they're great men in the sort of capital G, capital M trademark mode, um, but also were, did horrific things, right? And were able to be personally cruel to even like close family members, in addition to like committing acts of genocide as they were um, running around being capital G, capital M, great men. I've, you know, I've written about Robespierre, I've written about Napoleon. Um, and so one of the things that sort of low key drew me to Lafayette and why I wanted to, to write about him more is that he seemed more like a good man than a great man. 
Right. And I don't, and I, you know, other people have asked me this before, is he a great man? Did you write a great man biography? And it's like, I, I feel like I kind of wrote a good man biography. He, he never quite got to that supreme level that even Washington got to, or that Napoleon got to, or his contemporaries got to, because he didn't quite have that, that really ruthless streak in him to be like, uh, like sociopathic or so narcissistic or so uh, blind to uh, the, the sort of damage that he was causing by his actions that he could go out and do the kinds of things that re- are required to make your mark in history. Um, so he made his mark in history and he's heavily involved in so many like really, really important events. And I think he was a transformative figure, but along the way, he was mostly a good person who was trying to make the world he lived in a better place. And I think that's that was one of my sort of uh, thoughts about him going into it that was more or less confirmed as I as I went through the details. I didn't find t- there's stuff in there that I'm like, oh, man, you shouldn't have done that. Um, but I, I think in the main, uh, he comes out very, very well from it, from a detailed accounting of his life. And that's an important distinction when people go really far into the great man history, it's often because they feel a defensiveness. And that's not something that I ever felt when I was reading this book. You were, when you experienced something that was disappointing, you just delivered it straight. There wasn't, you weren't apologizing, you also weren't aggrandizing him. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you, what was your relationship like with him over the years? You know, you spend so much time with this person. Yeah. Um, he's my friend <laughs> at this point, you know, I, I, um, you know, I, I heard once like before, uh, before I, I sat down to write a biography, somebody did once said like, if you write a biography, you wind up either hating your subject or loving your subject. That's kind of like the two things that happen. And I, I don't know like exactly how true that is. Um, but if, if it's one or the other, I definitely skew on the side of like, I basically like spending time with this guy. Um, I've read so much of his correspondence, so much of the things that were said about him by people that were close to him, by people that were far away from him. Um, he had, he himself had kind of a self-deprecating sense of humor, right? He, he never, he, he wanted to be taken seriously, but at the same time, never took himself too seriously. He, he was willing to have a little bit of humility and admit his own mistakes. And I think that um, him having that personality and him having that character made it very easy to just sort of describe the good things about him and describe the bad things about him. And I think honestly, like if he, if he read the book that I wrote, the things that I said, like, you know, like this right here, I'm not, I'm not too sure that you should have done this or this right here. This is, this is a sad ending to this story, this good thing that you tried to do. I think he would have said, yeah, I know. Right. And I, I feel that myself. Um, because nobody's going to be completely perfect. And, uh, you know, certainly I haven't lived my life mistake free. You know, if anybody wrote a biography of me there, they'd find things that are like, Oh, Mike, really? Like, yeah. (laughs) But, um, so I think that's what it is. My, my relationship with, I spent so much time with him for three, three and a half years, um, that I don't really, I'm not sick of him. Um, I still enjoy uh, reading about him. I still enjoy talking about him. Um, I love talking about this book. So obviously there was, there's some through line to him that, that makes him an appealing person um, that was very present in his life at the time. And I think just has kind of continued on through the years. I think that's true. I think one of, um, they, they do stay with you. You know, it sort of feels like what I imagine it's like to send a child off to college. Like they're out in the, in the world, you know, you mm-hmm. look- stores today you saw them living their lives they look happy people are you know they're meeting new people but you don't stop thinking about them Mm -hmm. you don't stop like and and even evolving in your thinking about them and that's what's really interesting um something else I really liked that you you know I don't think you I mean I don't want to speak for you but I don't think you consciously followed or um I don't know, you know, tried to portray these rules of biography when it comes to these like great men, it seemed like you just naturally told the story. And so you allowed yourself this freedom to engage with him as an actual person, a person in history, but a person nonetheless who, you know, was once a teen and, and no one, you know, no one wants to share their their letters and diaries from when they were teens. Right. Oh, Lafayette as a teenager is great. It's one of my favorite little moments in this. I would love to write a sitcom about Lafayette at Versailles as a teenager, but continue on. No, yes. no, no. Um, so I was, I was thinking that you, you, we're going to get back to that. Hold that thought. 
I was thinking that you um, you often sort of will use these metaphors and analogies that you don't find um, in, in traditional biographies and people notice, right? There were moments like I called, um, you know, the revolution Washington's like pregnancy and then the he had to like take the baby to term. And right, exactly. To make sure that the baby like lived to like, you know, to survive on its own. And that's why he had to serve as president. And you sort of gave into that too. Did that just come natural to you? Or did you sort of think, huh, it's always been described this way, but it really seems to me to, to be more accessible and make more sense in this other way? No, I, I, you know, when I sat down to write it, I did have, I did want to, mm, not just make it a sort of, I, I, how, how was it? How did I put this at the time? I didn't want to write a social studies report about Lafayette. Like that's, and that's what I was actively avoiding trying to do, um, was just deliver a social studies report about Lafayette, um, that, you know, did the work and, and gave the facts and analyzed his place in history. Um, and then just sort of leave it at that, which is about what, you know, and I've gotten a lot out of biographies that have been written like in that style, but in, in what I was trying to do, I, I did want to give it more of a literary quality and aim for metaphors and aim for ways of describing things or trying to turn phrases that you would expect to find, um, you know, like in like a novel or in or in something like that. And, and a lot of the places I went to, you know, for inspiration, there were lots of things I was trying to grab. Um, but there there are these kind of like gentlemen biographies that were, you know, come out of like the 1910s and the 1920s. Like I read this, I read this one by about Jose Antonio Paz, who was, uh, who was one of the Spanish American revolutionaries. And it was by this guy who was like a sometimes adventurer, like, you know, big game hunter slash member of parliament, you know, slash navigator who also wrote books on the side. And like the, the way that though, the way that some of their language was used in those books, I was like, I, I kind of like this. Like, I don't, like, I'm not going to appropriate your, your attitudes necessarily, but the language and the way you're, the way you're using language, I thought was very like lively and interesting and, uh, tried to bring that into the book. And I think, I think succeeded in the, uh, for the most part in what I was attempting to do. I don't think it's a social studies report about Lafayette. Yeah, definitely not. Although wouldn't that be fun if that was like a requirement of our social studies, we would be yeah. a little bit better. Um, so, okay, so now obviously we need to hear a little bit about Lafayette as a teen, and also may I suggest that you write sort of a group biography, Teens of the Revolution. Mm -hmm. it's, called the it's called yeah. the guillotines. It's called the guillotines. Of course it is. Yep. Don't worry, it exists. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, <laughs> with like John Quincy Adams having all his like adventures in Europe while his dad's trying to secure loans. Mm -hmm. um, Lafayette, you know, earlier around Versailles. So tell us, give us a good, give us a good team story. Okay. So Lafayette comes, so his backstory is that he is like this, this rustic noble, right? He's an, he's a rich orphan who grew up in, you know, what is the equivalent of the sticks? I mean, he was a, he was a Lord. He lived in the manor house. He lived in the big house of the small village. Um, but he's from just this small village and in, in a not even today, not a particularly populated part of France. Um, who moves to Paris and winds up marrying into one of the richest and most powerful families in France, the Noai. Like, and it's like, you know, um, you know, second, they're, they're basically second only to the Bourbon dynasty, the Royal, the Royal family themselves in terms of their, their wealth and power and importance in place. And Lafayette uh, enters this world and it's just, you know, he just doesn't quite fit in. Um, his manners are a bit more bumbling. He, he, he very clearly like went through like a growth spurt, where he, where he was sort of physically awkward as he's, you know, going through puberty and transitioning into being like somebody who can carry around. Cause he was kind of a bigger guy. Um, and so he comes into this world and he has to hang with basically like the rich kids, like the rich click at school. I mean, this is, this is kind of a tale that we're all very familiar with. It's some, it's somebody who's come into like some rich high school and is now suddenly trying to hang out with the jocks and the captain of the football team, who's the Comte d'Artois, and hang out with the head cheerleader, who is Marie Antoinette. And he's really just not quite able to do it. Um, he, when he gets drunk, he gets kind of falling down drunk, um, and he becomes the butt of people's jokes. And there's, uh, you know, there's definitely a moment in there that's reported from a couple of sources where he, 
uh, does dance with Marie Antoinette and steps on her feet a couple times. And like, she's just laughing at him. So he's, he becomes this awkward laughing stock in this set of people. And you can just imagine like rich, like super rich, super powerful teenagers have always like, they're kind of the same wherever you find them. And the, the meanness that goes along with that, the, the jibes and the, um, you know, the gossip and, and sort of trying to take him down, like all of that existed around him. And it's part of what allowed, it's part of what moves him out of that scene because of how uncomfortable he was. Um, and then it's very strange that he find that, that when he finally feels like he's comfortable, it's like, it's in some like crummy tent in Valley Forge is where he, as a person finally begins to feel comfortable, even though he was living in probably literally the most comfortable place on earth, which is Versailles, like in the 18th century, which is Versailles. And he just, he didn't like it there. It's interesting. You bring up Washington and Lafayette were good friends, you know, almost um, family. And Lafayette, of course, named one of his sons, George Washington, lived with Washington for a while. Um, Sometimes, though, they're so different, right? You talk about um, Lafayette losing himself in public. Washington would never. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, they have so much. And, and, and so people, and, you know, their thoughts on slavery, which I want to get to, very different. Mm -hmm. um, but they do have a lot in common, which is that they both had to marry rich, found love in their partners, found good partners. Um, and also felt most at home in these incredibly uncomfortable situations. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, that's something that I do think is, is true of both of them. Um, because by the time, by the time that they get together, I mean, Washington, you know, he does marry into the money and he, you know, Washington grew up very used to being in a, in a rustic setting, right. He was comfortable tromping through woods and comfortable sort of enduring the hardships of nature, like all, all the stuff that he was up to, you know, as a young, as a young militia officer, like sort of before and, and during and after the French and Indian war, um, which would, you know, we in Europe would call the seven years war. Um, but, uh, they both, and Lafayette had that too, right. Had that ability. Cause he grew up tromping around in woods and tromping around in the hills and forests. Um, and both of them had a kind of physical endurance and an ability and, and, a, and a willingness and a desire to, to um, put themselves in difficult circumstances and endure them. So even though Washington winds up as like, you know, one of the richest people in the colonies, he's living in this plantation. He's he if he wanted to, Washington could have spent his life enormously pampered. Right. And the same is true for Lafayette. He could have spent his life enormously pampered and neither one of them quite ever wanted that. They wanted to go out on campaign. They they preferred to be like, well, it's 20 below, but I'm going to stand here in my coat and, and you know, sort of um, and endure this. And even though Washington did it with in incredible stoicism. Right. You know, or at least his projected stoicism and Lafayette never was able to quite project that same level of stoicism. He still enjoyed being able to prove that he could do all of this stuff. Right. He maybe couldn't keep up um, guzzling wine with French aristocrats, but he could absolutely keep up with a frozen winter in Valley Forge and not really ever complain about it. Right. And that's a true thing about him. I think he was I think that he was ve he was much more comfortable enduring hardship than he was just sort of kicking around in a life of pleasure, which I think is probably mostly true of Washington too. at least the things that they set out to at least the things that they kept aiming for always put them in uh, in a world of hardship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Washington was more, I think because he, you know, they both needed money, but Lafayette had a bit more of the perks that Washington felt like really denied to him. Mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. A little bit more invested or let's say bitter, um, invested in his home. And also, you know, when your um, wealth is invested in people, you mm -hmm. know, a whole different story. But before we go there again, um, another thing that they have in common is they're known, you know, you call them a hero and no one's really going to totally debate that with Washington. They'll say he was a hero, but he wasn't in this other way. They're not considered great statesmen. They're not considered great thinkers. They're sort of, um, their contribution 
was to be born during the right time for their particular inclinations and that they went hard, right? That's sort of what they're celebrated for. I push back against that in, in my biography of Washington because I feel like he's completely ruled by the public court of opinion. It's so important to him during the revolution. He's actively thinking about setting up America as a country to enter the scene and look stable. Um, he's, you know, inventive. He's a quick thinker. I would argue he's a little bit better at all that than maybe he would be on the battlefield. Did you, do you think that that's an unfair rap that Lafayette gets as well? Yeah. Well, in the sense that like, um, you know, Lafayette and Washington too were surrounded by some pretty genius level people, right? Like, in, like is Washington a an intellect compared to like Alexander Hamilton or Thomas Jefferson? Like, you know, no, but that doesn't make George Washington like a tree stump when it comes to like his intellectual capacity. And I think the same is true for for Lafayette, you know, when you talk about the people who were running around late 18th century France, which is like, you know, the enlight this is the enlightenment. These are some of these are some world historical geniuses um, that are that are operating at a very high intellectual level. And, you know, I think it's true that Lafayette is not, you know, hanging up there with Condorcet, for example, or um you know, with Mirab well, I don't know, M Mirabeau was kind of a bullshit artist, so maybe not Mirabeau. Um, but I don't think that that means then that he was a dunce or he constantly made mistakes or, um, you know, he was just in over his head. I, I push back against the notion that Lafayette was in over his head, which is something that a lot of people say about him. Um, was he in a situation where anybody would have been in over their head. Yeah. I think mostly that's what it is. Like he was trying to accomplish something in, in, in like, if we move over to the French revolution now, like he's trying to, he's trying to maintain order in revolutionary Paris in 1789, 1790 and 1791. There are very few people who actually could have done that job and not wound up being ejected from the revolution the way that Lafayette was. Um, so I think that he was like Lafayette was a very bright guy, a very nimble guy. He too was very, um, he was very aware of public symbols, of um, public perception of him, of of how to present stuff. And Lafayette is also underrated in the because he gives you know the tricolor, the tricolor cockade, the the flag, you know the uniforms in the National Guard, um, all of these things that then become. The, the, the permanent symbols of the revolution. Lafayette is the one who like gives this to everybody. So clearly he knew something was going on. Um, and so like um, the thing that I will finish uh, by saying about this is that he doesn't write any great treaties. He doesn't write any great books, um, but you know, he mostly succeeded at what he was trying to accomplish. And that is not something that can be said for most people that he was also around. He survived many years in a French prison. Mm -hmm. Some people, some rich people party hop, he revolution hop. I know I love a period drama. I will watch the worst one. I will oh, yeah. listen to the, like, doesn't matter. I will find something to engage with and something to like really take joy in, even if I think it's terribly done. Um, but it, is it a little bit hard that with the popularity of Lafayette also comes Lin-Manuel Miranda's conception of him as this kind of like lusty Frenchman, like the JFK of Frenchmen. Yeah. Um, and he was a young man with a young wife. So like, give us, break that down for us. If you, you know, what would you sort of tell us to be wary of while enjoying it? I listen to that soundtrack constantly. When I yeah, was. right. I mean, and like the thing is about Hamilton, like, I mean, just when, when it came time for me to pitch a biography of Lafayette, you know, the fact that Hamilton existed made it very easy for the people who were like in the public. Like, so the fact that that show existed, that it was such a cultural phenomenon, that it brings these people out into the forefront that when I would walk around and say, oh, I'm writing a biography of Lafayette instead of what I would get a lot of, which is like, who is that? I've never heard of him. Um, at least a chunk of the time people are saying, oh, Lafayette from Hamilton. I love that guy. He was great. Um, so that, that makes, that made my life very easy as a biographer and it still to this day does. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like an over the top exaggeration of what a French teenager would probably 
be acting like. But I got to tell you, um, you know, a lot of this didn't make it into the book because like I was trying to move through his whole life instead of just dwelling on his uh, exploits in the United States. Lafayette did very well for himself in the United States. Um, Lafayette was a virile 19 year old, 20 year old, 21 year old who was very far away from his wife. Uh, he was not particularly faithful to Adrienne during the uh, during the, the American War of Independence. There are lots of little anecdotes about him. You know, uh, he was, he's at some boarding house and he comes down the stairs and uh, and, you know, somebody's like, oh, well, how did how did you sleep? And he's like, oh, well, her bed was a bit short, you know, like stuff like that. And like he when he gets caught out on Barron Hill. You know, one of one of like he almost gets captured by uh, by General Howe uh, in one of the first campaigns. And, you know, he's he's in bed with a local probably prostitute is what he is doing at that point. So, yes, Lafayette did uh, did quite well. Uh, he enjoyed his time in the United States as a as a dashing French officer, and he made the most of it. So it's like is what's going on in Hamilton, like, you know, completely made up. Was he just was he some like, you know, like very reserved um, you know, like I'm super faithful to my, no, he was a, he was a French teenager who's looked awfully sharp in a uniform and knew it. Well, wow. and probably not wearing purple velvet, but not far from it. They were he was, uh, yeah. I mean, he was, a, he, he's, he's often described as a clothes horse, right? He, he liked buying like in, in terms of like the kind of the, the, fr- when he, when he got into frivolous spending, the big thing that he would frivolously spend on was his clothes. Um, so even that's like, yeah, I mean, he's not, he doesn't, he didn't look like the Joker, um, but he, you know, he looked good. That's the thing about, they did, we should, we should emphasize that while they loved being in their tents in the middle of the like wilds of the Ohio, they very much loved to look good. And mm-hmm. they did like velvet, Washington loved this like black velvet suit and they were always, you know, ringing up bills. Um so that was definitely, and, and you mentioned something that I think is important that, that surprises people that both of them are very into designing military uniforms. They got into those details quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So their territorial like inclinations were not limited to their dress of leisure. Um, but they, their biggest difference, of course, besides, you know, they had their like own stories with their rich wives in Washington, I don't think was ever unfaithful. There's been the suggestion of it, but it really seems unlikely. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lafayette is what so many presidential biographers and presidential homes want their subject to be. He talked about things and did them. He actually evolved over time. The more he learned, the more he interacted with the world, um, the more he changed. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't an angel as we've reviewed, but in all kinds of ways. Um, Lafayette's claims tend to match his actions. So talk to me about his evolution. This, yeah, this is probably one of the things that I changed the most in my thinking about him before I went into the book. And then as I was researching the book, because, um, you know, the, the thing that is said about Lafayette, especially in his later years, as people start doing retrospectives of his life, they're like, the thing about Lafayette is he was consistent. The thing about Lafayette is he, he started believing one thing at the beginning of his life and he just stuck with it his entire life. And it, it is true that like he identified with this, with this word and this concept of liberty. And he always associated himself with that. And that is consistent. Um, but as I was reading him, I, I watched him change several times. I watched him adapt several times and it was often because he had this sort of North star of this concept of Liberty and these concepts of equality. Um, But he didn't start his life as an abolitionist. That's something that grew on him. He didn't start his life, um, you know, believing in democracy. And for most of his life, he's not really ever like an out and out small D Democrat by the end of his life, like in 1832 and 1833, he is giving speeches about how like, you know, just because I'm rich, that doesn't mean I should be allowed to vote. Um, And at every step of his career, he's always looking at whatever the status quo is, right? At in any given year, in any given place, in any given time, he's looking at the status quo and trying to figure out what here can be made better. Like, what can we reform? What can we improve on? And so he was never going to just sink in there. Like, I contrast this with, if you get to the end of the book, you get to Francois Guizot, 
who's like for us an obscure French politician, but was quite a major figure in French history who had like a rigid idea of what things needed to be. And he didn't want to go further than that. Lafayette was always ready to change and evolve and grow. And that was something that was consistent about him for his whole life. So the knock on him that he just sort of like had this one idea when he was 19 years old and then stuck with it for the next 60 years is not something I actually encountered in the human being that I wound up studying. It's this, it's this lazy device where they, it's funny, they want to say like, oh, this man was destined to do this thing. And it's so uninteresting and it denies them all this like interesting work and mm -hmm. um, complexity. There's, it's not a liability. It just makes for like a great read and a lot of lessons. Yeah. And when Lafayette, you know, when Lafayette was developing, you know, as an early abolitionist, like in the early 1780s, there's a great, you know, moment where he's writing to John Adams, who was then uh, the, the ambassador to Great Britain, uh, saying, because that was where abolitionist literature was most advanced. He was like, please send me a crate of books, because I don't know anything about this. And I kind of think that maybe slavery is bad. Please send me every book. He says every book that has ever been written on the emancipation of the slaves, because I want to read them all, because I've got this suspicion now in the back of my head that maybe slavery is something that is not actually compatible with liberty, but I need to learn more about it. And so he does. Um, and this is something that he does for the rest of his life. He, at the same time, you know, remains close with Washington for the rest of Washington's life. He goes to Mount Vernon. The only times I really have found accounts of Washington getting drunk and going around Mount Vernon and mm -hmm. getting in trouble late at night were with Lafayette. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, he's the fun friend, he's the good friend. And Lafayette spent a lot of time talking to Washington about slavery. Washington, this was at Mount Vernon, his forced labor camp. Um, he owned hundreds of people. He was, it was his longest occupation was being a master, almost his entire life. And Lafayette would write to him and say, my dear friend, what if I go in with you on a scheme? Think about what it would look like for America if you set this example. You know, maybe we'll go half seas on some property and basically propose tenant farming. Mm -hmm. And Washington would write back, you're so sweet. Mm -hmm. I love you. You're such a good person. Let's talk about this when you visit next in five to 10 years. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Literally nothing happened. Literally nothing happened. How did Lafayette reconcile this great love and adoration he had for Washington, you know, the namesake of his child, you know, et cetera, with this... Um, what a John Brown would call like di crippling disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a deal breaker, but it also didn't, did, how much did he struggle? I think, you know, la, la, it, it, his relationship with those, like not just Washington, who was obviously the closest, like, like Washington is the most powerfully uh, 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 present. There's the most powerful presence in Lafayette's life. It's, it's somebody who he's going to try to emulate for his entire life. And I actually wrote in the book that when it comes to abolitionism, that um, Lafayette is always trying to emulate Washington in every way. But in this case, Washington should have been emulating Lafayette, right? In this, in this instance, Lafayette's got it right. And he's trying to do the right thing. And Washington is the one who is sinking back and actually not following through on his moral duty, like as a human being. Um, and this is true of his, he's very close friends with Washington, or excuse me, with Jefferson. He's, he's going to be close friends with Madison. He's going to be close friends with, uh, with James Monroe. And it's one of those things where, you know, you've gone through a lot with people and you do form these very, very close connections that then your thinking goes off in a different direction from theirs. And Lafayette spent his whole life hoping that his friendship with these people and that his connections to them would ultimately convince them to change their ways. Right. So he is not, he didn't do the thing where he's like, I don't believe that slavery is right. And therefore I can no longer be associated with you. And I can no longer be your friend. He never did that. Um, and I think some people could reasonably criticize him for that, right? It's like, you know, you gave your pitch, slave, it's like slavery is an evil in the world. And then when they said no, you just kept going to their house and hanging out with them and treating them like everything was fine. The thing that Lafayette was getting from them, though, and this is, this is true of all of them, is that they would say to him, number one, yes, you like this is you're obviously a great person for, for suggesting that we end slavery. And we all know slavery is bad. Um, 
we we hope that within 10, 15, 20 years, it'll it'll uh, naturally go away. You know, we can't do it right now. It would just be way too disruptive. But down the road, yes, we're all aiming in the same direction. I think that Lafayette, you know, he he can be naive about the United States and he could be naive about the direction that things were headed. And he believed about the country, the same thing that he believed about his friends, that there was something wrapped up in the ideals of the country and something wrapped up in the fact that it was founded, at least in his mind, on these principles of liberty and equality, that it was moving in the right direction, even though they weren't moving as fast as he would have liked. Ultimately, I'll keep pushing them. I'll keep suggesting it. I'm not going to rock the boat too much, right, because they are my friends and I don't want the country to fall apart. Um, And then but they'll get there eventually. And the thing is, in none of their lifetimes did they actually get there eventually. So by the time he's on his deathbed, you look back and you're like, well, they, they never did it, did they? You know, they kept saying they would. They kept saying you're a great guy for suggesting it. Uh, they kept hearing you out. You know, they didn't boot him. You know, he kept bringing it up and they weren't like, dude, shut up. Like, this is this is how I make a living. Um, and I don't think it's that big of a deal. And I'm tired of you, you know, carping about it. Um and they just maintain those relationships. And I think it's a, I think it's a fair criticism if somebody wants to make it. Um, but I just think it comes from a place of, of just a, a slight low grade naivete about both their entrenched economic interests and the, the social, political and economic reality of the United States at the time. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to turn to a question soon. I'm afraid I have to share my with the audience, but I have another question because you had to move to France. I did. You had to to research this, which means that you know a community that I don't, you know my world, you know the Washington world, you know the players, um, you know the perception of Lafayette here and the founders. Lafayette and and then you know George Washington is this universally loved man so it's kind of consistent and the British are weirdly obsessed with him it's it's like a little like he left he left you but Lafayette it's not the same in France can you talk about that duality yeah and I think um you know one of the other things probably the first most interesting thing that I ever discovered about the Marquis de Lafayette is the two different ways that he is treated in the historiography of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Because I wrote I wrote a series for the podcast, for the Revolutions podcast, about the American Revolution. Lafayette shows up. He's this dashing French teenager. He's bumming around with Washington. He's a great friend of liberty. He's a great friend of the country. We, he helped, you know, he helps bring France into the war. So it's all, it's all good stuff, right, about him. And then I knew that Lafayette was going to show up in the next series I did, which is the third season of Revolutions, which is all about the French Revolution. And so as I was leaving the American Revolution, I started reading all these books about French history. And whenever Lafayette shows up, it's just like, oh, and here comes this dumbass Lafayette who, you know, couldn't do anything right. No, Lafayette, well, you know, he'll be gone soon, so we don't really have to worry about him. Um, you know, Lafayette, who was, you know, famously constantly asleep at the switch. And I was like, well, are we even talking about the same guy here? Like, this is only a couple of years later. I don't feel like he dramatically changed as a person. Um, and to and to be perfectly frank, I don't think that he did. And so that sort of portrayal of him became made him interesting to me as a person. And what I tried to do in the book is mostly create one single continuous personality who uh, progressed through the American Revolution and the French Revolution. He didn't change dramatically. He didn't suddenly become incompetent. He never was incompetent. Um, and I think that it is very true that French historical memory does not rate Lafayette as highly as American historical reality or historiography does. Um, and I think that the French have a tendency to underrate him. Um, it's not it's not because they're French and they know their own history and they've got it right, which is, you know, often something that I would feel when I would talk to them about this. Um, It's more the case that the French have their own running battles about the French revolution that are ongoing to this very day. Like the French revolution continues to be a live thing in French politics. And these other pe- people like Robespierre have a home inside of that debate. Like what you think about Robespierre, there are people who support him. There are people who are opposed to him, but he's very much a live figure. There are people who will defend him. And Lafayette's position in the French Revolution, where he is simultaneously trying to impose a constitutional monarchy on France 
to uh, in opposition to conservatives, monarchists, traditional Catholics who don't like any of this. So they wind up hating Lafayette because he's trying to impose all these things on him. But he's also sort of running against the populist Jacobins, right? And he's against Anton and he's against Robespierre and he's against Desmoulins, these heroes of the, the people who become the heroes of left-wing historiography. Those guys all hate him too. So he's homeless. He becomes homeless after his death. And when he died, like there's this thing like, oh, the French hated Lafayette. The French didn't care about him. Like he was enormously popular all through his life. When he died, like literally hundreds of thousands of people turned out for his funeral. Louis Philippe uh, and, and and his ministers were afraid that maybe his, yeah. his funeral procession through Paris in 1834 was going to spark a revolt and spark a revolution. Um, so it wasn't that he lost his popularity or wasn't an influential figure during his life or wasn't treated as a serious person. It's just that over the years, he didn't really have an active um, party, an active faction inside of the French ongoing French discourse. And so he just has kind of fallen, fallen by the wayside. So he needs like an Eric Foner and Annette Gordon-Reed. He just needs <laughs> or Mike Duncan. He just needs someone. Except, except I'm just, except I'm just some American. And when, when I would go, I remember this, this happened to me actually a couple of times um, and the, uh, where I, I would go to like a library and I say, I'm, I'm here, I'm an American. I'm, I'm doing this all in bad French, by the way. And, um, and I'm writing a book about like the French revolution and the revolution of 1830. And they're like, oh yeah, cool. What's the topic? And I said, um, the Marquis de Lafayette. And they would say, oh, well, you're an American. Of course, it's about the Marquis de Lafayette. Like, you're the only people who ask for material about the Marquis de Lafayette. Yeah, I think it's also frustrating to them because they get, like, zero credit for ushering us towards Yorktown. Yeah, So it's which they like, did do. I Hopefully, yeah. I established that in the book that, yeah. you know, we weren't winning that war without the French guys. No, we keep saying that. But, mm -hmm. like, there, no one's listening to us. We, we have, you know, they're like, freedom prize. Um, okay, so I will I will turn this over. This is from Joel. Consider how fast everything moved during the French Revolution. Does Lafayette feel like he failed France or that it was out of his control? Would it be possible to emulate Washington and France? Um, okay, so th there's a couple of questions in there. One of them is that you know, I got I got to say by 1791, when Lafayette is ultimately he's he's gone through this series of sort of debacles uh, as he's trying to be the commander of the National Guard. And he winds up resigning from the National Guard uh, in late 1791. By by this point, you really get the sense that Lafayette feels like it's not that he failed. It's that the people failed him, um, that he that he was doing the right thing. And they just kind of wouldn't get on board with it. And he was being treated on, he, he felt like he was being treated very unfairly um, because he was being attacked by both the right and the left. And every time he tried to do, he was, he was playing whack-a-mole with, um, with everything that was erupting through this time. And, and, and I do get the sense that when he sort of looked and, and, and he, you know, he has um, uh, uh, reflections on the course of the French revolution that he writes later in his life. And you do kind of get the sense that he doesn't feel like he made mistakes. He feels like the situation was out of his control. And there were these rabble rousers on both sides, whether it's Danton or whether it's, uh, you know, like ultra royalists like the Comte d'Artois, who were constantly screwing things up and making his life a living hell. Um, so I don't think it, it, he doesn't go too far down this track, but like, I think that's generally his attitude towards it. Um, the other question is like, could Washington have succeeded in the French Revolution the way that Washington succeeded in the American Revolution, that kind of feels like, no, I don't think that he is able to pull that off. There's a, there's a great quote um, that uh, I did try, that I, that I jammed in there for sure, which is Bonaparte looking back on the French Revolution and saying, well, if I had been in the United States when George Washington was there, I would have been a George Washington too, because Washington didn't have to deal with like foreign invading armies and civil wars and social unrest. I'm like, have you, did you ever read a single book about the American War of Independence? That's all it was. It was a civil war and like people invading and people trying to, people trying to undermine him. Uh, so Washington succeeded in the situation that he had. I, I mean, I don't see him making it out of the French Revolution in one piece. No, no, totally. I mean, 
he never and he also didn't really go anywhere he went to Barbados once oh right well also he doesn't speak French right that probably that would have definitely held him back in the French Revolution was not you know didn't you know didn't indulge like it really wasn't hedonistic in in too many important ways to French people but not to stereotype um this is I hate hypotheticals And I'm sure you do too. When it's like, what would Washington think if he walked on the street today? He would be like, oh my God, this is a street. That's a lamp. Mm -hmm. It's so moving. It's so noisy. (laughs) But I I can I can stand a hypothetical when it's actually about the time period and it's like something could have happened. I think this is interesting. Um, you know, because we sort of hinted, we sort of brought this upon ourselves with the talk about Washington and slavery and, and Lafayette's conversations with him. Had you know, could he have really made a difference? Blah blah blah. Do you have a sense for what role Lafayette could have excelled at if he stayed in America? Was there potential for him to more actively shape the U.S. and government, either as a senator or cabinet member? Steve M. would like to know. Okay, so he 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 got a couple of offers. Um, along the way, um, re- really from for really from both sides. Like the the most famous offer he got was that uh, when Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, completed the Louisiana Purchase, he asked for Lafayette to come be the ju- uh, the the governor of the Louisiana Territory to bring him over here. We'll set you up in New Orleans um, and have you be the governor because we just inherited all these um, these crazy French Catholics from you know the Bayou and we don't quite know what to do with them. And it sure would be nice if you were here, which he turned down because there were there were health reasons and and uh, and personal reasons why he didn't want to leave France at that point. Um, Lafayette's great role in American politics in general was as a unifying figure, and we know for we know that. Um, American politics at the time was incredibly factional, right? It was very, very cutthroat um, between the Federalists, between Jefferson's party, whatever you want to call them, the Democratic Republicans. <clears throat> and Lafayette existed above all of that. Um, he was loved by both Hamilton and Jefferson, who were arch enemies of each other. When Lafayette goes on his tour in 1824 and 1825, like the, the election of 1824 was one of the most insane presidential elections in history. It was a four-way race. You know, it ends with nobody having secured a majority in the electoral college. And he's, he lands in the middle of it, but all four of the presidential candidates, all of whom would love to stick a knife in each other's ribs, you know, are coming to dinner to share the table with this one guy, the Marquis de Lafayette. So the thing is, when you then say like, what if he had stayed, become a Senator, tried to run for president, done any of these things? I think what happens at that point is he completely loses that reputation, loses that role, no longer has the kind of moral authority, personality authority that he was able to, um, uh, that he was able to engender as this sort of like person coming in from afar who was unifying everything. Um, and I think that then he just winds up in the same kind of factional struggle he got caught up with in France, probably would then have tried to stay aloof from it, but wound up pissing everybody off. And he winds up, you know, in retirement someplace in Ohio. So I think if he had actually tried to mix it up in American politics through those years, he would not have been as successful nor as beloved um, as he is today. Yeah. I mean, Washington didn't want to be president. He would, you know, when, when, the revolution started he was in philadelphia he was like i couldn't possibly be the general while wearing his uniform but i don't think he went to be president he, he i don't think he yeah to lose he was marching to his funeral he called the procession to the inauguration he it was he was universally loved it was all going to obviously go terribly and it did he ended up you know estranged from almost every founder so absolutely it, mm-hmm. it, and, the thing that people forget about both Washington and Lafayette is they weren't driven by power. When they had it, they they wielded it. And when they didn't, they were like, I'm good. Yeah. And I think that that's part of what makes Lafayette a good man more than a great man is that he didn't, he was not driven by a lust for power. He wanted to be renowned. He wanted to be famous. You know, he had he had very great ambitions. Like he loved listening to a good speech talking about how great he was. Like he he loved all that stuff. Um, but he he did not have the kind of like power hungry drive 
that many of the people around him did. I mean, he, this is a guy who's like alongside Napoleon Bonaparte, right? The contrast between them is quite clear. Um, and I happen to completely agree with that interpretation of Washington. I think he absolutely wanted to be commander in chief of the Continental Army. That was his great dream. And then when it came time to be president, people were like, oh, he was dragged from Mount Vernon. Yeah, like, but, but he was actually kind of dragged from Mount Vernon. He didn't want to do it. Um, and so I, I think that because of that, that's where Lafayette sort of is both simultaneously a more appealing person to think about and talk about, but also would have been one of his de- is a persistent defect um, about him is, is that he didn't quite. Um, you know, there's other political mistakes that he made, um, but one of them is just that he always was kind of like, want, like if somebody offers him the presidency, he's like, I don't want to be president. Like, I don't actually want that job. And he successfully was not president in a way that his old mentor, George Washington, uh, failed at not being president. Twice. Yeah, twice wow. failed to not be president. Fa- talk about failing off. Yeah. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't ask you an off-repeated question. Jaden, uh, hey brother, love the podcast. Uh, he wants to know you've alluded to new projects. What's next? Mm. The one and only Mike Big Pimpin Duncan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not telling anybody. Uh, I I know. So I'll like I'm because the thing is I'm wrapping up Revolution. So I I've got a, a lot of incredibly nervous fans out there who don't know what I'm going to do next. Um, and I I will continue to podcast. Right. I'm leaving Revolutions aside, but like you know I've got a very nice thing going here that I really love to do. Um, and I have, but I just have other interests that I want to explore. And I think that there is a leader in the clubhouse in terms of what I'm going to do next, uh, I'm not going to say what it is quite yet. Um, because I, if I change my mind, I don't want people to come back around and say, Hey, you, you said that one time when you were at the strand with Alexis co that like you were going to do this. Um, so I'm kind of keeping it under wraps. Um, at the next book, I'm, I'm a little, I'm less cagey about what the next book will be. Um, we, I want to go back to Roman history and there's a very particular period of the, that I got out of the history of Rome. Uh, that is about the crisis of the third century and that centers around this emperor Aurelian uh, that has been on my mind for like 10 years and is absolutely a book I'm going to write. And so uh, hopefully everybody pre-ordered the book and bought the book. And then my publisher will be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You sold enough copies. So we'll let you write this, uh, this other book about the crisis of the third century, which I'll go to next. Will you move there too? No, no, no. We, we, we did, we did our, we did our run through Europe spent COVID in a 500 square foot, your tiny European apartment. And um, now we're good. You're good. I'll go down to the library. I'll go down to the library and read all about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a lot of that. There's also, I'll ask one more fan question. Then we'll go back to Lafayette. Okay. V- people want to know gentleman Johnny's party train shirt coming back. Um, I, yeah, I get that one a lot. I think uh, the answer to that question is when the show actually ends, whenever it ends. I mean, anybody who's listening in real time knows that I'm marching through the Russian Revolution, more or less in real time, right? Like every week I'm covering like about a week. So Lord knows when Revolution is even going to end. But uh, there will probably be a big blowout fundraiser to end the show. <clears throat> and the Livia Did It shirt and the Gentleman Johnny's Party Train t-shirt are the two most consistently beloved shirts and i'll probably bring both of them back for for that well they'll be very excited um th- so speaking to your earlier point i don't like to talk about my next project because i feel like the more people talk about it like the slower it goes and the and the less likely it is to happen and also i'm not sure on everything and so one person wants to know originally the title was going to be citizen lafayette yeah why? Yeah, never t- never say the title of your book before you never. I have made a huge mistake. So what you felt like Hero of Two Revolutions was a better description of it? Yeah, there there was a there was a there was a couple of things that fed into it. Um the, the, I think the two things happened simultaneously. One of them is, I mean, just to get this off the plate, like the marketing department came back and said we would prefer something like a little punchier. Right. But when the marketing department, sales and marketing came back and said, look, you know, it's fine, but like, can we think of something maybe a little bit punchier, something that like jumps off the shelf? 
um, as sales and marketing departments are wont to do. When they asked me that, I was not at all opposed to it because I named the book really before I had done all the research on it. Like, and when I went back to, even as I was writing the book, there, there's no time in Lafayette's life where he's called Citizen Lafayette. When they, when they move to that sort of nomenclature, when they get rid of the, the aristocratic titles, his aristocratic title was the Marquis de Lafayette. His family name was Mortier, right? He was de Mortier. So he would have been Citizen Mortier, not Citizen Lafayette. There is, there is no time where you combine the Citizen with the Lafayette. The, one of them gets dropped. And then the other thing is that the people who were really pushing for that sort of citizen Mortier, citizen Riquetti, you're like that kind of stuff, were his political enemies, right? That that phase of the French Revolution, when all, when all that citizen this and citizen that gets going in the red liberty caps, um, is 1792, 1793, 1794. Lafayette's been ejected from the revolution by that point because the people who were um, who who were following, who were doing that in the French Revolution were his enemies. So I was already by this point feeling like, I don't know that this title is actually like fits with what the, with the book I'm writing here, nor with like sort of the facts as I'm encountering them. And then sales and marketing came along and said like, ah, Citizen Lafayette, it's a little dry. And I said, okay, we can change the title. It's a great title. It's a great title. And I like the, um, I like the cover a lot. These title, these titles and these books do tend to all look alike. So it's really nice to see something that's a bit old. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Like the, the typeface that they use, like they, they, we wanted to give it like a more modern look. We were actively in the same way that like, I wasn't trying to write a social studies report on Lafayette. We were not trying to do this looks exactly like every other sort of founding father biography or, or, you know, great man biography that, that you're going to see on the shelves out there. I'm going to combine two questions because we're running out of time. I, there are a lot of questions about your process and whether okay. writing this book was different than the last. Um, and also related to this, I'm combining this, when you were in France and you were going around to all these places you've talked about and you've written about, what was that like? So those are two sort of process questions. Okay. Um, so the first one, like the, 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 it's very, this, this happened with the history of Rome going to revolutions. It happened writing storm before the storm to, uh, writing hero of two worlds is that when you're dealing with Roman history, you are dealing with a very small pile of fragments, right? That you have to take these fragments and tease out of them information. You have to do so much reading between the lines, taking some little snippet here and some inscription over here and trying to build like a mosaic out of incredibly tiny amounts of fragmented sources. Like that's um, the great challenge of people who study ancient history. That's the challenge that they're facing. When you move to the modern world, when you move to something like the French Revolution, it's exactly the opposite. There is just literally millions of pages of primary source documents about everything that happened at this time. And it is such an enormous pile of things to sift through that it's, it's how can I, from this, figure out what I need to read, how I need to read it, what, is, what are the things that I need to be bringing out of this to bring the story together? So it was, it was two, two very different problems, right? Um, which, you know, I think wound up, it, it, both of them are good and bad in their own ways. There's, there's a nice thing about Roman history where if, if you really sit down and go for it, you can probably read literally everything we know about Roman history, which you cannot do. Um, like even, you know, you do Washington, right? I mean, how many volumes of Washington's papers are? There's like 50 volumes. You, you can't go through all of that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's insane. Um, so the other question then, what was the other question? Oh, what, what was it like to be in France? Oh, this was the best. Um, so I'm in Paris, right? And I live not actually too far from the Hotel de Ville, um, not, not too far from Léon. Uh, and I was able to go and take my laptop and sit and write chapters in the places that I was writing about, right? And the atmosphere of it, the feel of it, I'm a, I'm a great believer in the power of inhabiting spaces where the history actually happened. I mean, when we used to do these tours and hopefully you know, like, COVID may go away at some point, we can do tours again. But I would take people out to like the battlefield at Cannae in Italy, which is just a field, right? But to just be in that place is a special thing. And I think it did, like if I wrote the book in the United States, I think it would have been very good. I think the fact that I wrote it in Paris, in the places that these things were actually happening, I just think 
gave the pros, gave me, gave, gave, you know, like a, there's a sensuality to uh, what I'm describing that I don't think exists if I'm not there. So I loved that I did. I still love Paris. Um, it's a, it's a lovely city. <laughs> it's a lovely city. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to go back. Um, Sarah Giorgini is here and she is um, famous in our world. She is an archivist at the Massachusetts Historical Society um, and an expert on the Adams family, John Adams, Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams. And she- Patricia Pugsley, the whole group. All, the, all of them. She's got her hands in every volume. So she really, she's all over it. Um, and she had a good question and I want to sort of expand it, which is that, you know, talk to, we know about obviously the relationships between Washington and Lafayette, Washington and Hamilton, you know, we know a lot of these things, but she asked, you know, what are the other voices guiding him? Who should we look at? What other relationships, people who haven't read the book, you know, what else, other things should they really be looking out for to get away from the things that they know, the things that you were really interested in? Um, well, I think, I think the first thing is that like it, to over, it, it's almost impossible to overemphasize how much of an influence Washington had on Lafayette. He absolutely was like the most important thing that Lafayette always had in the front of his mind. Um, but, uh, there were others, right? So there's like the Abbe Renault, right. Who was an enlightenment philosopher when he was very, very young. And when you're trying to like, for example, pick through this, this, this very obvious question that is actually difficult to answer. Like when does Lafayette first latch on to the notion of liberty and equality as being a thing that, um, uh, that somebody ought to strive for and fight for. When does he start first getting these ideas that maybe slavery is a bad thing? And I think some of it comes from Abbe Reynal, who wrote um, this this huge thing called the, the the history of the two Indies, which is ostensibly about you know a very boring history of uh, French colonial uh, uh, the French col French colonies in the Americas, but which he smuggled in like all of this incredibly seditious material, incredibly radical thinking about uh, the way that Europeans were behaving out there in the world, which Lafayette read as a young man. And I think a lot of that got into his head because he, he went to the United States with these ideas kind of already formed in his mind. And he finds them, you know, they, they obviously take great bloom when he arrives in the United States, but he didn't go as some, you know, mere mercenary who was just trying to win, uh, uh, you know, battlefield glory for himself, like most of the other French officers who went over there were, he was idealistic from the start. Um, I think he gets stuff out of, uh, out of Masonic meetings that he was going to, he wasn't a huge Mason, you know, like, I mean, George Washington was, uh, was obviously a, a pretty big Mason. He was super into it and inducted Lafayette into his Masonic Lodge. And that's part of what allowed them to become very close. Um, but I think it, it's nice to look at the, uh, another, another good person, uh, is Condorcet, the Marquis de Condorcet, who is, um, uh, uh, one of these early enlightenment social philosophers and social reformers who was also, even before Lafayette, really truly latched on to his abolitionism, was writing criticisms and critiques of, of African slavery that, watch, that Lafayette winds up reading. Um, so, th so those are a couple, like, uh, like Renan, Condorcet, things that were being said in the Masonic lodges. Like He's getting a lot of this from France. It's not just like he went to the United States and learned all of these things. Yeah. Okay. So there are two, I want to ask you two questions, but one I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to tweet because I think it's unfair not to follow up. Um, Devin wants to know, he said that you mentioned on a podcast that Adams, I assume John Adams, okay. is the only one to have ever said anything bad about Lafayette. What did he say? Was it jealousy? Now, Adams, always good for the burns, 50 a day, tweet that out. And then let's leave with Jessica Spencer's question. Okay. Positive note. For our time, are there any lessons or takeaways for our contemporary politics that you took from Lafayette's life? Sure. Um, question. Yeah, just a very, just a very small thing because we don't have much time. Um, the thing about okay, I'm going to go off on a thing here. Um, there is a tendency that people often have to subconsciously believe that things like progress and reform. Um, change for the better are just sort of things that happen. Like look back on history. We, history is a story of progress. So like, don't worry about things. Things will get better because 
progress will take care of it. This capital P progress or capital R reform, like, like look back, like aren't things better for X, this group and that group? Like, yes. And you want to know why? Because people fought for it because people got out and did something about it. And the very people who um, you think are like, are, are like radicals today, right? That you would say to them, like, why are you making such a big deal? Like, just calm down. Like, we'll do incremental reform. Like, even incremental reform doesn't happen without lots of people making it happen. It is something that human beings do themselves. And Lafayette was somebody who, from the very beginning of his life to the very end of his life, was constantly using his money. He was a very rich guy. He was constantly spending money on what he considered to be good causes, noble causes, just causes. Um, his time, his energy. Uh, he patronized uh, uh, writers. He patronized, um, you know, printing presses. He's always trying to spread his ideas. If it got to the point where he believed that things were not progressing fast enough or well enough, he's willing to go into revolution to achieve his aims. Um, so I think that really the, that lesson is to constantly look at the world that you're living in, which he always did, as I said, th think about the things that can be made better because there are always things that can be improved upon and then work to improve them. Don't just assume that it's going to happen by some mystical force of history or mystical force of progress. I absolutely don't believe that those things exist. Lafayette didn't believe that they existed. And, and to get back to something that you know, we talked about earlier, like, did Washington or Lafayette really like write some, some groundbreaking philosophical treatise or write some book that was, became very influential and changed everybody's thinking? No, these guys were, they were men of action, right? And they believed that their actions were the things that were going to change the world. And both of them focused on their actions as things that were going to change the world, not mentalities, not, not you know, dishing some, uh, some witty barb in a salon setting, but to go out and do these things. And we have got a lot of problems right now. Like with a, humanity in the 21st century is about to face a very troubling and trying time. And if we're going to make it through this and we are going to succeed, we are going to have to do it. We cannot just sit back and expect it to happen for us. I, I'm tempted to just take control here and just keep going you know, for like another hour. Well, the guy, the guy's not coming back. Oh, I, there he is. Can we kick him out? No, I'm just kidding. So I, I want to thank you for this. Everyone enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was wonderful. And congratulate you on the book. Thank you very I much. I encourage everyone again to read these books and to talk about them. They're a great way to make these connections to our present. And um, thank you to The Strand. Yeah, love The Strand. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both so much. That was such a good conversation. Uh, to our audience, thank you for spending your evening with us. I brought links to books by both. Alexis and Mike in the chat. So feel free to click on them and get some extra copies of each. Yeah, buy buy many copies. Yeah. You need more than one. You gotta give it out. You gotta give it out to your friends and family so you can so you can have conversations about it. Holidays are coming up. Mm -hmm. Only like five months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on that note, thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thanks a lot.